Welcome to the Crohn's and Colitis Summit, where we explore how you can heal the gut by changing your diet and lifestyle. This is Ravi Jandiala, and I'm joined by my spouse and colleague Malika Alu in welcoming our special guest, Dr. Bruce Huffman. Dr. Huffman is a Calgary based integrative and functional medicine practitioner. He is the medical director at the Huffman Center for Integrative Medicine and the Brain Center of Alberta specializing in complex medical conditions. Dr. Hoffman is a board certified and has fellowship in anti-aging medicine as well as master's degree in clinical nutrition. In addition to his clinical training, Dr. Hoffman has studied with many of the leading mind, body and spiritual healers of our time including Deepak Chopra, Paul Louis, Osho and Ramesh Balsekar. He has shared the stage with Dr. Deepak Chopra and Dr. John F. DiMartini and he continues to spread his inspiring vision of healing and wellness with the audiences and patients all around the world. Dr. Hoffman, it's a pleasure to have you in our summit. Thank you so much, Ravi. Doctor, as part of our healing journey when Malika was working on reversing her ulcerative colitis, yeah. we reversed that we have to look beyond modern medicine. Now, before I go into the question, I want to clarify one thing. We are not against modern medicine. If I break my leg, I'm not going to put a herb or something on it and expect it to heal. Allopathy or modern medicine is an excellent choice for life-threatening or traumatic situations. However, when it comes to treating autoimmune conditions, especially like uh, Crohn's and colitis, it only does disease management by suppressing the symptoms. Having said that, there could also be times when we have to combine both these approaches of, say, allopathy and holistic healing. I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, one of the great privileges of having a medical degree, and um, I never started out wanting to be a medical doctor. I, my interest was in literature and poetry. I somehow found myself doing medicine, and since uh, since I sort of evolved into what I do now, I, you know, I look back with awe and wonder, and I'm very uh, feel very privileged to have access to traditional medical system, and the use of drugs um, when I need to use them. Uh, however, let me just say that I've had to refer some patients with uh, IBD for biologics when uh, all the lifestyle and um, um, all the natural medicine uh, principles that I knew, every trick in the book, just didn't turn, reverse the course. So having access to that system is fantastic, but um, being able to expand beyond that system is another great privilege which I've been able to investigate over the years and then incorporate and, and bring it into what I call the seven layers of or seven stages to health and transformation which is nothing than a sort of a system of looking at a person's experience through the Ayurvedic model of this, of what they call the koshas or bodies. We come into the world with these certain subtle levels and bodies. Yes, we know this body, the physiological, biological body, but this body has sort of got different layers and levels to it. It's interacting with the environment. You know, that's, that's the external body that we interact with. And then we have this physicality, and then this physicality is energetically innovated. And then our energy bodies are influenced by emotional fields. And our emotional fields are, inter uh, are interrelated with our thoughts and beliefs and concepts and attitudes and stories we tell ourselves, which are then further subtly influenced by what we call the soul. In the first half of life, we're driven by all these goals and determinants of hormones and the need to be seen by parents, peers, and loved ones. But in the second half of life, we have to sort of look at who we truly are, who we left behind in the pursuit of our ego-driven drives and ideals. And that's this, we call that the soul. It's the deepest part of who you are. And then transcendent to our physical existence, there's a great mystery, the great cosmos. And that is a mystery and it's said to be a field of infinite intelligence and wisdom which has uh, drives which we can access to if we just quieten our mental field and listen. Not many of us do that because we, most of us believe we're at the center of the universe. <laughs> and it takes a lot to suspend that belief and really know that 
in the infinite scheme of things, we probably don't play a huge role. <laughs> we are a finite speck in the infinity of the cosmos. So it depends on how you look at things. Very intriguing, Doctor. This is very similar to what Ayurveda says. And I believe in Ayurveda, it's, it says uh, something like this. Uh, they say there is a physical body, there is energy body, then there is mental body, emotional body, and then there's spiritual and ethereal body, astral body. There are many different layers to us. Layers and level, what you're yeah. saying is very congruent to what Ayurveda says. Yeah, I took, I took that model from Ayurveda because I studied Ayurveda for many years and went to India and did an internship in Pune. So I used that model to, to bring together uh, conceptually diagnosis and treatment and experiential levels of those realities. Plus I combined Ken Wilber's uh, integral theory of everything. And so I was able to um, write this roadmap of different layers and levels through different um, di experiences, scientific designations, diagnoses, and treatment across the layers and levels from, you know, s from detoxification to self-actualization. And then put and slot into all these layers and levels different different modalities of treatment like sometimes people will go to an acupuncturist which is level three the energy body when they should be seeing an oncologist which is level two traditional medicine and so forth and so on and, and vice versa so i tried to create a roadmap a sort of a new medical um, curriculum if you will for the new medical practitioner to expand their their innate wisdom beyond what we learn at med school, which is very mechanistic. And the mechanistic system of medicine is, you know, it's given horrible names like uh, name it, tame it, and drug it, or N squared, D squared medicine, the name of the disease and the drug. We do, that's what we learn at med school. It's, it's very it's mechanistic, it's very one, you know, two dimensional. And it's necessary, but it doesn't lead to much excitement. <laughs> it doesn't lead to much creativity when it comes when you're sitting in front of somebody, um, they're bringing everything to the table. You know, they're bringing the entire experience to the table. Not only are they bringing the entire experience, they're bringing the inherited ancestral experiences to the table as well. You can't divorce anybody anymore from what their parents and grandparents and ancestors went through. We know epigenetically those inf those influence the the epigenetic expression of methylation you know children are having you know massive episodes of ptsd from their grandmother's internment in in the nazi death camps there's no explanation for it but those experiences get epigenetically transferred and then this person sits in front of you and the body is the final resting place of the entire experience what are you going to do you know, look for a symptom, give it a name and give it a drug. That's, that's simplistic and adolescent in, you know, you know, I mean, when complex disease, simple disease, it's fine. And if all you have is a biologic in your toolkit, then fine, use that. But when you're coming to assist a person in a related way to the entire um, potential antecedents, mediators and triggers of why they're sitting in front of you with their symptomatology, you've got to bring everything to the table. You can't just bring the name of the disease. What's that? I mean, that's, that's interesting, but it's not going to give you a roadmap of how to transform that person's experience. So Very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it, it gives us the importance of why we need to look at uh, things holistically and uh, rather than following this reductionistic of, yeah. approach of looking at a problem and a symptom and then just yeah. dragging it. Relatedness, symptoms, bi systems, biology, how everything in holons within holons, how everything's embedded within something else. How can you separate somebody from their cultural experiences and their relationships and their animals and their, you know, their exposomes, what they're exposed to and their toothpaste and their dentistry and you, a head injury? You can't, you've got to know it. You've got to know as much as you can in order to be effective. And that's, that's my. That's my belief anyway. And that's, that's an excellent take, Doctor. Now let's deep dive into that. You yeah. touched a little bit on the seven stages of healing and transformation. Tell us yeah. more about it. Well, again, I, I, I use, so level one is the external environment, the, the exposome, what we expose to out there, you know. 
the um, the forests are um, our lungs. You know, the rivers are our bloodstream. The earth is our is our body. So we in this constant interface with the environment. We're streaming in and out. We're not fixed solid bodies. We're constantly interfacing. It's, you know, Deepak likes to say we. You know, I have in my body the the what does he say the the cells of Jesus Christ, and you know, we're constantly exchanging information with the external world, so we can't divorce ourselves. So, the way we name that in medicine is toxicology. You know, mm-hmm. what's coming into our systems that's either nurturing or harming us, and so we de- we we go deeply into in level one, we look at the incoming toxic burden of chemicals, metals, infectious agents, mental stress, anything that's, anything that's externally influencing our, 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 our biochemistry and our electromagnetic systems and our methylation repair pathways and our detoxification pathways. And now, through Robert Naveau's work, we know that the, the incoming chemical and environmental stresses have a huge effect on the mitochondrial function. And the mitochondria shut down when the incoming toxic load is excessive. They withdraw and create the uh, expression of external DNA and ATP, which then sets up another inflammatory cascade. The mitochondria shut and they withdraw. They create inflammation, trying to withdraw you from the world from further insult. And so we get massive symptomatology and we name it specific diseases whether it be chronic fatigue syndrome autoimmune disease fibromyalgia they all have at the basis mitochondrial destruction from this incoming level one toxic burden and now as we you know probably you've heard many times on your on your summit the toxic load is unbelievable it's uh, we don't truly have the capacity to withstand a lot of these incoming toxins anymore they're just ubiquitous everywhere we turn they everywhere so level 1 is toxicology but you know primarily and then level 2 is biochemistry and structure you know how we structure we use we have great dependence on nuka chiropractors and body workers to look at structure and dentistry with tmj and bite but biochemistry, we look now at biochemical pathways in level two. We don't look at disease diagnoses so much, the DSM-5, six classifications of disease. We look at biochemical pathways, you know, what they call in functional medicine, antecedents, mediators, and triggers of biochemical pathways. And we look at those in great detail. We do lots of lab work looking at biochemistry, not just a few. We do like tons of lab work looking at, you know, nutritional uh, input, how our gut does, the the ecological structure of the gut, whether it's permeable, what the dysbiosis fragments are, whether there's high histamine, whether there's zonulins. I mean, you've probably heard this over and over again. With IBD, you get this increased permeability with um, zonulin being increased, histamine being increased, and then the leaking across of the gut membrane, lipopolysaccharides, which are bacterial sub uh, wall fragments, which then stimulate inflammatory proteins in the submucosal layer. And so we look at that in great detail. We look at the biochemistry, nutritional status, hormonal status, methylation status, detoxification status, mitochondrial status, look at great detail and balance all of those levels. Um, with IBD, of course, you, you've probably heard how nutritionally deficient people can become. Mm-hmm. So it's incumbent upon us as natural physicians to balance, um, you know, those, those uh, entities. We know IBD is, the increase of IBD, particularly um, Crohn's disease, is vastly linked to vitamin D levels and where you live in the environment. You know, people in the northern latitude have a higher incidence of IBD than in the southern latitudes, probably due to, you know, we think the vitamin D exposures. So we look at vitamin D. We also know with IBD that vitamin A and vitamin E and beta carotenoids are more deficient than in the normal population. So we look at those and measure them. And uh, fatty acids, we know that I do extensive work with free fatty acids, so omega 3s, 6s, 9s, trans fats, saturated fats, and particularly my great number one nutrient is phosphatidylcholine. 
Phosphatidylcholine fixes all sorts of things, including gut permeability, cell wall integrity. We have 70 trillion cells, each cell surrounded by you know, a membrane made up of phospholipids and, and minerals. And then within each cell, we have set 90 to 1,000 mitochondria, also surrounded by the same phospholipid membrane. So fats dictate your fate like you will not believe. So if you don't regulate your phospholipids and your omega-6 and your arachidonic acids and so forth and so on, you can't fix you can't fix cells or cell membranes or mitochondria. You just can't. So we look at fatty acid distributions and we look at labs that do that, um, and we balance fatty acids in great detail. You know, and looking at diets too. We know diets high in sugar and carbohydrates have adverse effects on IBD. We know elemental diets have some benefit. So we try and find um, the diet that's most beneficial to IBD patients. In my experience, what I've learned is um, the paleo autoimmune low histamine diet is usually where I begin, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's not that difficult to diet. <laughs> but uh, I've found that because of my cell activation in the gut, which has been associated for a long time now with IBD, We've got a lower mast cell activation by reducing histaminic foods and then doing paleo autoimmune. So we remove all grains, all um, legumes, all uh, nightshades, most of the fruit, uh, and then all the histamine producing foods, the leftover foods, the, and, and this is the big thing, all the, um, all the fermented foods. Now, I know there's a big trend in gut health to use fermented foods. Not so fast. I spend my life taking people off fermented foods to heal their mast cell activation because they activate mast cell. And then later you can look at them if you stabilize H1, H2 receptors in the gut. So the diet we end up using is, you know, paleo autoimmune low histamine. It's been the most efficient for, for my practice anyway. And then we've got to combine other bits and pieces, high FODMAPs, high oxalates, high glycemic index. You've got to mix and match ketogenic versus non-ketogenic, fasting versus not fasting. You've got to juggle all these different pieces. And then from an Ayurvedic perspective, you can't put a person, you know, who's vita imbalanced on a low carbohydrate diet that's dry and without oil. They go crazy. They can't, that's just the exactly wrong diet to put them on. So you have to then filter what you learn through all these seminars we attend what constitutionally that person, who that is, is it a vata, pitta, or kapha person? They have very different diet preferences, whether it's warm, oily foods, cold, dry foods, hot or cool foods. You can't put a, you know, a pitta person on hot, spicy foods. They will just blow up. <laughs> they get very sick. So you've got to filter all of these variabilities, and it's incumbent upon the practitioner of the future to know these varieties of dietary applications because you're going to be asked over and over again. You're going to get all types coming in front of you, and there's no one size fits all. And you've got to vary your diets according to who's sitting in front of you and what their biochemistry is telling you, who they are constitutionally and who they are biochemically and who they are from a toxicological and a genetic perspective. You know, there's many variables to bring into play. Anyway, that's level two. Level three is uh, electromagnetics. You know, we, we, we vibrate. Mm -hmm. Our DNA literally vibrates at a very high frequency and gives off this standing wave around us, which actually dictates biochemical pathways. Our biochemistry is dictated by electromagnetic fields that are originating from your DNA. This work's been done by Albert Popp and others in Germany. And those acupuncture meridians, which are considered to be somewhat speculative, they're real, they exist. They've been photographed as biophotonic fields that come off the body. And um, so we also then have to take into account from a toxicological uh, perspective all the effects of electromagnetic fields. Uh, and so we do lots of work with EMFs. So we look at electrical fields magnetic fields, radio frequency fields, dirty electricity. And part of our team is the, um, you know, are the um, building biologists who go into homes and create sleep sanctuaries and turn off the routers and turn off the iPhone with the, put the airplane mode and, you know, unplug the plasma TV that's creating dirty electricity and 
put a kill switch on the electrical switch downstairs, turn off the router at night. Um, this is essential because we know from many studies now, there's 28,000 studies done out of Europe showing that EMS produce muscle activation and histamine. And when we sleep at night, the average person sitting in the home, in an inner city home, has got two to three volts running through their body at night, when you should have 10 millivolts according to the World Health Organization standard. That's crazy. Yeah, and those volts create, you know, they create a stress response, which opens up permeability. The blood brain barrier, the mitochondrial barrier, the gut barrier gets opened by that stress response. When you're sleeping in a stress response all night, it creates permeability through histamine and through something called MMP9, which then depletes melatonin, melatonin being hugely influential in antioxidants for the brain and gut. You know, melatonin is huge in the gut. So when we're sleeping in electromagnetic fields at night, with this voltage running through us, plus the EMFs, um, you can't heal anybody with great efficiency if that stress response is generated. Because you don't heal if you're in a stress response. Mm -hmm. You only heal in a, in a relaxation response, in a healing response. So you, you know, if somebody's highly mentally stressed and living in high EMFs and eating a junk food diet and has high toxic burden, yeah, good luck. It's not going to happen. <laughs> As you probably found out, you've got to clean up everything. Yeah. Absolutely. I think at the minimum, what we can do is at least turn off the Wi-Fi at night times and put our cell phones in airplane mode. Yes, turn off the Wi-Fi and um, uh, turn off the airplane, to put your phone on airplane mode and try and get the kill switch on your electrical fields if you can. And if you can, don't have a... Um, sorry, my cat's jumping up here. <laughs> uh, don't have a... Box spring mattress and um, a metal frame bed, that helps as well, you know. But building biologists go in and they measure your voltage in your bed at night, and the average is two to three volts in the inner city. And then level four is all to do with emotions, the emotional body. And that's a whole can of worms, you know. People are born into, into you know, people are born into family systems that often generate early childhood trauma, whether it be abuse trauma or neglect trauma, or what we call interrupted bonds with caregivers. And the first 10 years of life, the child entrains with the mother's right prefrontal cortex to develop a sense of self and learn to self-regulate and feel safe in the world. But if the mother's offline because of inherited trauma or not being seen by her mother, she doesn't care, for, or because she's worried about father who's not coming home at night because he drinks or is having an affair, that mother's not attuned to the child, and that leads to a disruption in the entrainment and self-regulation of the child, which then develops a stress response and a hypervigilance, which can be detected on a QEEG or a neuroquant MRI. And that then sets the HPA axis for chronic stress throughout the person's life. And they wonder why they're having anxiety and sleep disturbances and palpitations at 40. When if you ask, if you take a good history, they had an interrupted bond with their mother. The mother didn't see them or the child was in an incubator for the first two months of life, which set up terror and hypervigilance in their child's myelination of the brain. And if you don't take a history, from conception onwards, and even before conception, you can't elicit that history. And so you're going to, have to label that person with an anxiety disorder or sleep disorder, but the antecedent was in the inherited trauma from the grandmother or the fact that she was in an incubator for two months and was never seen or self-soothed, or the fact that she walked around on eggshells because dad was an alcoholic, so forth and so on. So you've got to take that history. Mm -hmm. And so early adverse experiences, we know from all the ACE studies, have tremendous negative effects on health outcomes in later life. So without taking that history, you also won't look at, won't be able to identify all the potential triggers of, of, of inflammation. Now, interestingly, the gut is a metaphor or symbol, if you will, of mother. Why? Because it, it takes in nutrition and it absorbs nutrition. So it's highly linked to the autonomic nervous system.
-hmm. So many people with gut disturbances, you can ask them about their relationship to their mothers, and you'll often find there's an interrupted bond somewhere along the line where they weren't in trained and weren't seen and weren't fully you know, regulated by their mothers in the first 10, 20, or 30 years. It takes 30 years for the, your own prefrontal cortex to learn to inhibit your anxiety by your parent acting as an external prefrontal cortex and inhibiting your anxiety by making you safe. You only myelinate that part of the mammalian brain up to about 30 in women and men a bit longer. Men, <laughs> men never develop fully until they're 35 or 40. You look at people, they're always looking back to their parents until they're 35 or 40, until they have their own kids and they're sort of free of that anxiety. So if you can't inhibit your early childhood traumas because you weren't seen by your mother or myelinated by your mother's um, entrainment, you will, develop a, you will develop a hypervigilant autonomic nervous system, an HPA axis, which then has tremendous effects on GI functioning. You know, tremendous oh, that's, effects that's on fascinating GI facts there. Yeah, it's fascinating. You, if you don't take those histories, you can treat IBD with a biologic, go ahead. But if you look back and upstream, you can find all sorts of things that you need to look at to learn. One of the best things we do in our work is learning, teaching individuals how to develop a core sense of self and self-regulate. You know, because the, the gut is highly innovated through the enteric nervous system, as you know, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetics and parasympathetics, which then, you know, connects with um, the immune system in the gut, you know. So the autonomic nervous system, so sympathetic, parasympathetic, is connected to immune function and inflammation. So if you're not self-regulating that system, your gut function is dysregulated. You get overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, under production of good bacteria, gut permeability issues, leaking across of lipopolysaccharides from bacteria and the whole inflammatory cascade. So part of the treatment of an IBD patient is self-regulation. Using the heart math devices, I'm sure people have been speaking about that, you know, M-wave training, Epsom salt bars, Tai Chi, yoga, breath work, integrated body psychotherapy. There's millions of ways to stimulate the relaxation response, the vagus nerve. I suppose you've had talks on the vagal nerve stimulation, gargling, singing, you know, yes. all those things, coffee enemas. You know, there's many ways to regulate the stress response in the gut. But you have to have salience. If the patient doesn't know why they're doing those, that becomes non-relative. They just become something else they've got to do, which stresses them out more. But if they know that they've got to learn to self-regulate because they weren't seen by their parent and they didn't learn ever to self-regulate their stress response, they now have homework to do and they have salience, they have relevancy. And so they would do it because they know why they're doing it. It's not just something their doctor told them to do. And so you have to take an adequate history and look upstream to see whether those factors are playing a role. And if they are, patients, the compliance shoots through the roof. If you don't create salience and relevancy, it just becomes another stressor, which they'll do for six weeks. You know, there's a difference between being inspired and motivated. When you're inspired, it's because something inspired, your spirit gets, in, gets inspired. You know, motivation is from the outside, inspiration is from the inside. Mm -hmm. We don't heal if we don't get a new image and a new story and a new a whole new set of biochemistry and thoughts. We have 60,000 thoughts a day. Most of them are the same as yesterday. Most of them produce the same outcomes in our biochemistry if we don't change the content through neuroplasticity and insight. So if people get a new image and a new story and they change the internal dialogue, it leads to different electrical, chemical signals that go into the genome that transcribe new proteins that create Different, you know, different chemicals that beat your heart, run your GI tract, and make you breathe oxygen. So our internal dialogue affects our physiology dramatically. So it's incumbent upon the practitioner to assist that person in creating a new image, a new dialogue, a new narrative, 
about their reality and not to live with the same old thing, you know. That I think also goes with the belief system. A lot of people are rigid with their own beliefs and are not open-minded. Rigid. It's unbelievable. I'm treating a person right now who's highly traumatized and, um, you know, death of children and, and brother and, and being abused by the medical system, etc., etc. And the belief system is so, and, and, and an abusive father. So patients will often project onto the practitioner unresolved issues with the parents. So if the parent was punitive and, and oppressive and patriarchal, that person won't, you, you also, like I said, you, you can only heal if there's, if there's a, a parasympathetic relaxation state. You also only heal if there's trust. You can't heal if there's no trust, you know. If, you, if you're giving over to somebody else your system and asking them to help interface, it's almost like an abdication of patient advocacy, and you don't trust that person in front of you, Healing can't be complete, but people with early childhood trauma to that extent don't trust, particularly parental figures, particularly there's been parental trauma. And that gets projected onto you, the so-called, you know, object of their, they're handing over to you, but not with much trust. And you can't penetrate that system. It's impenetrable because the belief system, which is unconscious, gets projected onto you and they... This person, whatever, I, I spent four hours interpreting their labs for them and I dictated it. <laughs> so diagrams and handouts didn't make any difference. You know, his, his belief was such that I'm not trustworthy. I did, I, I did my, I mean, I spent days preparing because I knew that was the dynamic. But still, his inability to trust, his early trauma trumped his ability to Absor uh, take in new information and create a new narrative. Not everybody's like that. The majority of people who consult with you in this world, in this field, um, are prepared to invest time, money, energy, and um, take the advice. And so you get these tremendous transformations. And you know, people who you know given up all hope, seen everybody. You know, you know the story. Um, when they start to see layers and levels of their experience and things that they can do, not only just take this or, you know, take vitamin C, take quercetin. Yeah, take quercetin, it'll stabilize your mast cells, but that's like 100 thousands of complete healing. There's many more layers and levels that have to be brought to the uh, relationship, you know. Absolutely. So we covered the first four stages. What are the last three? <laughs> And then the level five is the, the ego structure and the mind, the beliefs. That's where the beliefs, uh, we have those 60,000 thoughts and those create our value systems, you know. We always seek pleasure and avoid pain and our values determine what we seek and what we ignore. And so our beliefs, our sense of self, then create this internal dialogue which creates... Um, how we orientate our, ourselves to the world. And the first half of life, as I said, is very different from the second half of life. We're taken up by drives in the first half of life to become something. First of all, we've got to be seen by our parents to be safe. First 10 years, we just be dependent on our parents. And if we're not safe with our parents, we develop hypervigilance. So the drive is to be safe. The second decade, we need to be seen by our peers. And that's why all this bullying and thing is so bullying is so um, uh, unfortunate because if we're not myelinated to accept ourselves through our peer group, we develop, you know, nasty internal dialogue and a punitive superego where we think we're not good enough. And then the third decade, we try and seek the spouse to procreate the selfish gene and procreate the species. We educate ourselves. We try and earn money. We build a house, we take out a bank loan, and we try and move forward into the world. That's all drives. You know, Freud was right. Adler was right. They're drives of the first half of life which take us over, and we can't ignore them. Jung, the great psychoanalyst of, you know, compa uh, uh, compatriot of, of Freud, refused to take on patients in the first 30, 40 years. He said, there's nobody home. He said, there's just this individual of drives. You know, there's, there's no consciousness, there's no self-reflection, mm -hmm. and it's sort of half right. You know? it's, it's not entirely true. 
But in the second half of life, which can start at 35, we're driven to become more ourselves, more of our authentic selves. And then we seek to bring home the parts we left behind in order to achieve the first half of life drives. And so then we, we become what's called more soul-driven rather than ego-driven. And that's a very different flavor. It's a very different orientation to our life. We want to know who we are authentically, what parts of ourselves have we left behind, what parts of ourselves do we need to bring home? Because ultimately, all sickness is homesickness. You know, we we have to bring parts to bring home the parts of ourselves we left behind, and that's a different phase of healing, which takes us into level six, which is soul, our innermost core self. You know, when you're sitting here in front of me, you know your 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 body changes, your head moves, your emotions come and go, your breath moves, your thoughts come and go. But to whom are those happening? You know, who are you in your essence? That's your, your soul, which is, which is more of a witnessing, observant state from the Ayurvedic kosher perspective. It's an ob- observ- they call it the Atman, you know, the, the presence that's not identified with the objects of perception. You know? And then level seven is transcendent to that. You know? All reality is ultimately you know, frozen light. You know? <laughs> we know that from quantum theory. This table here is just light that's frozen into space-time reality. But transcendent to that is this infinite mystery, this cosmos of intelligence and light, or whatever you wish to call it, that has intent and, and, and genius. And if we just you know, suspend, you know, the ancient Greek um, temples had, they were open to the sky. You went in and you sat and you just, you know, you sat in reverence to the great mystery because in the grand scheme of things, we're not that significant. Uh, But we forget that and we make ourselves the center of the universe. So spiritual healing is when we identify with that which is not ourselves. And we we become observers of our reality. We watch our bodies. You know, I had a patient who died fully healed from breast cancer because she lived in that non-local place of unity consciousness where she knew she had achieved all she needed to achieve. And she was no longer identified with her physicality or her emotions or her attachments. She died fully healed. How's that? I mean, breast cancer patient. She lived seven years with stage four breast cancer. Most beautiful soul. You know, very interesting. So, so the that, stage that's, that's six the model I use. <laughs> okay, so the stage stage six and seven, so yeah. when you're talking about soul or spiritual healing, they are very abstract terms, and especially spirituality, it's a muddied word. A lot of people associate that with religion or their belief systems. Yeah. So, how do you use these in your therapies? Uh, well. It's, 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 it's subjective, you know, you can only point towards them, you can't do anything about it. But people, you know, pe- when people sit in what we call, uh, you know, subjective consciousness, not object referred, object referred is we are taking our cues from that which is seen through the five senses. And we interpreting that and then we make taking action based on those sensory perception. When people are self referred, through meditative practices or contemplative practices, they become the witness to what they are, you know, they become, it's the grand tradition of witnessing consciousness and, you know, Buddhist meditation. You actually become the witness to that which you observe and you no longer identify with that which is outside of yourself. That is not your core self. And you get to know that. And the more you do it, the more you dip into that reality, the more it infuses you with the qualities of that state which is, you know, integration, compassion, love. Love is the synthesis of all opposites. You just see both sides simultaneously in any situation. And you don't polarize into preferences of, of um, you know, pleasures and pains. You just see all sides of everything. And that's a, that's a contemplative, um, meditative state that uh, you can't teach. Uh, you, can, you can teach methodology. But it's a subjective, it's an experience. It's a different level of consciousness. You know, okay. it's, not, it's not on ordinary consciousness, waking, sleeping, and dreaming. It's, it's a higher state of consciousness. And then, Do you suggest any tools for them? Like uh, breathing exercises, yoga, meditation, something to that extent to awaken their consciousness? 
Well, it's again, it's it's not anything you do. You can point towards it, but it's an inner experience. It either happens or it doesn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, all those tools, they, you know, those tools all lower the sympathetic stress response, but they don't change consciousness. Consciousness happens from a, through a different mechanisms. In the ancient Eastern traditions, they call it satori or awakenings. And you get these series of mini awakenings. And it's only through, through, through mindfulness and sitting quietly can you experience a leaping consciousness. And drugs, you know, ayahuasca and other things people are doing these days. You know, people try and expand, they've been trying to do it for since time immemorial. <laughs> Everybody's, you know, they take different things to try and expand consciousness. But it's best to do it through sober living and, and try and expand consciousness through just, you know, it's, it's, it's luck in the end. You know? Indeed. So you can introduce the patients to new kind of therapies or treatments, but then consciousness also has a role to play in reversing their condition. So how important do you think is consciousness and raising that? Well, when, you, when your consciousness expands, you no longer identified with your IBD. Mm -hmm. Your IBD doesn't define who you are. So how healing is that? Yeah. You know. My stress levels will automatically go down. <laughs> Well, um, but we, we oscillate back and forth, you see. We, we are space and time bound, and we do get emotional, and we do get sympathetic drives. But if you can mitigate that by having yourself rooted in mindfulness beyond space-time, beyond identification with physicality, you're, you, 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 you have a different relationship to your IBD or your symptoms. There's a whole different flavor to it. So consciousness is everything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the highest level of healing is when you're living in that non-local um, sense of self. But, you know, we're also in our bodies, so we have to do the lower level healing as well. There's nothing left untouched. You know, mm -hmm. we eat clean, we change our microbiomes, we heal the leaky gut, we reduce the, mind, the stress response through mind-body techniques, we turn off the EMFs. We do it all. All layers and all levels of healing are needed. And sometimes we leave behind the more physical things and we just stay in our, in our pure self, our pure st state of consciousness. And like my patient, Deborah, she healed from, she died from breast cancer, but she died fully healed. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, the innate capacity to heal is within us. And like Hippocrates once said, the natural healing force within us is the greatest force in getting well. And to awaken that, I think the holistic view that you're talking about makes much more sense. But it does require, it does require consciousness and the understanding of layers and levels of consciousness. It, we, you know, um, the innate ability is there, but it sometimes has to be awakened by addressing all layers and all levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes uh, we can't turn off IBD with, with anything and we just need the, you know, Remicade or Humira. That's okay too. Yeah. Not, not the end of the world. Absolutely. I mean, people catastrophize and say, "Oh, I don't want. I pay, I don't want to be on a biologic. Why don't you want to be on a biologic? It's going to save your life." Oh, we, yeah. Then we talk about that, you know. Yeah. And we try everything else, but if it's if it's not working, take the biologic. Biologic also from you know, it's also a manifestation of the divine order. Why not use it if it works? Shuts down tumor necrosis factor and the, and the, and the inflammatory cascade, by, saves your life. Mm -hmm. Had one young kid, 15 years old, also did everything. And um, I said to the, the, the parents, you know, she needs to be on a biologic. And thank God they did. They put on it within two to three weeks. She was eating again and putting on weight. And she was near death. But they didn't want to use a biologic. Mm hmm. I only saw her in the end stages. I didn't treat her two, three years before. So I wish we had time to do everything else. But she was near death and she needed a biologic. And they took it and she's fine now. She's doing great. And now we're working back. We're cleaning up her diet and everything else. Indeed, indeed. Then, then it requires we have to go through whatever is needed to save yeah. our body. So yeah. coming back to the step one yeah. <laughs> of toxins. 
Um, You talked about toxins and how we are inundated with toxins in our indoor environments, outdoor environments, everywhere we go. Um, I'm especially interested in mold. Does mold have any impact to play in IBD manifestation? Yeah, mold is interesting. eh? I mean, I treat mold illness a lot. And mold exerts its effect through the innate immune system. And the innate immune system releases all these inflammatory cytokines. But it also triggers mast cell activation. And mast cell activation, as you know, is highly um, um, implicated in IBD. And so mold is a huge potential trigger here, for sure. And to treat mold, to identify, diagnose mold and treat it, it's, there's a sequence of steps you need to follow. And it's not very well done. Mm-hmm. It's poorly done. People get little get steps, but they don't get the full thing. You know, you've got to, A, take a history and look at the history and put it into this questionnaire called the SIRS questionnaire and see how many symptoms are there. And then you've got to ask questions about the home and the, and the car and the workplace and the cabin. Is there signs of visible mold damage? And then you've got to do ERMI tests. You've got to do DNA fragmentation of mold spores. And then you've got to do the visual contrast test to look for the effects of biotoxin illness on the optic nerve. And then you've got to do the shoemaker panel of cytokines to see if they upregulated influencing MSH. A nasal swab for Marcon's. Look at the hormones. Look at VEGF. There's all these things you need to do. And a recent uh, contributor to the field is the urinary mycotoxin levels to see if they're excreting the mycotoxins associated with the pathogenic molds, of which there are only about five. And, you know, if you don't do it in that sequence uh, and you don't send a, a visual, you don't send a mold inspector who does a visual inspection of the home. A lot of mold inspectors want to go into the home and wave an air sample and then walk out. That's not it. Don't it. Kick them out. You don't want that. They must look from the attic to the basement, look very finely for all sorts of evidence of water damage. And then you've got the things like the ductwork and your clothing and the carpets and the art and the books, what to do with those if you do have a mold issue. But yes, mold is huge. Mold okay. is huge. Always, okay. always look at mold. Mold and infections. Absolutely. Yeah. Any quick tips you can provide uh, for detoxification against these toxins? Uh, against mold in particular? Uh, mold and other toxins in general, because we are having these toxins everywhere, like formaldehyde on our furniture and all of the toxins that come from our cleaning products, the personal care products. How do we detoxify from all of that? It, well, that list is, it runs into infinity. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, just general, eat clean, you know, paleo, autoimmune, low histaminic diet. Organic, organic is huge. People poo-poo it. They say it doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. There's no question about it. Use air filtrations. You know, use a HEPA filter that goes down to 0.1 microns, Mm -hmm. not 0.3. The ones you buy at, you know, I don't know what you have in America, the Walmart. I would like something like that or Costco. That's 0.3 microns. They don't do the job. You've got to get an air filtration system. You've got to get a HEPA filter that goes down to 0.3 micro, uh, 0.1 microns, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, you've got to look at phase one, phase two liver detoxification pathways. Um, and you've got to um, use the micro and macronutrients that facilitate those, those pathways. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of genetic testing for cytochrome P450 enzymes and see if you have SNPs there. One of the best tests I've ever come across is the IGL um, mitochondrial test out of Germany. And that test is, is like my, it's, you know, highly, I covered that test because it tells me if your mitochondria are low in number, if they have enough uh, phosphatidylcholine surrounding the cell membrane, what the, what the um, uh, mineral levels are that create the micro voltage that causes the information going in and out of the mitochondria. It tells me if there's uh, DNA fragments outside the, outside the mitochondria. It tells me what toxins are sitting on the mitochondria, everything but infections. It tells me about chemicals, insecticides, glyphosate. Glyphosate's a huge one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it tells me about uh, heavy metals. 
and it tells me about fungal metabolites. So it tells me all this toxic burden. So if you've got fungal metabolites, you go down the mold pathway. If you've got chemicals, you go down the uh, liver detox pathways and the use of antioxidants like superoxide dismutase, canalase, and glutathione in huge amounts. Glutathione, glutathione, glutathione. You know, infrared saunas. Infrared saunas release, within the first five minutes of sweating, you release 90% of the superficial toxins on your surface. So infrared saunas are huge. Dry skin brushing, all those old naturopathic tricks, they actually work. So we okay. use them. Yeah. You're here right now. yeah. And then clean food and lots of vegetables, and, you know, high fiber intake. Fiber, you know, has been shown to have beneficial effects on IBD, particularly Crohn's disease. Not so much uh, ulcers of colitis. Okay. And strangely enough, more fruit fiber than vegetable fiber which uh, we will limit fruit usually because of histamine, but fruit fiber has been shown to be beneficial in um, Crohn's. Okay, excellent. Those are some of the great tips. Any other tips you want to finally share with our viewers for Crohn's and colitis especially? Um, with Crohn's and colitis, you know, you've just got to take a history eh? and, and you've, got to get, you've got to get all the, you know, or they, even silly things like airline travels going up above 2,000 meters being associated with relapse rates, you know. Um, you got to ask, you got to take this very thorough history and see what all your risk factors are. What is your, in, what is your stress response? What's your, what's your early developmental, you know, biography all about? What's your food intake? I mean, every time you eat, you're washing your genome with information either pro or anti-inflammatory. If you don't get your diet straight, forget about it. You know, they say, oh, the literature on food and IBD is not that great. It's, let me tell you from clinical experience, it's everything. Not, no, let me rephrase it. It's not always everything. But when it is something, it's huge. You know, like you take a majority, some, many people of gluten and casein, even that simple step can have a huge difference because there's a 10 times increased association of Crohn's disease with celiacs, you know. Mm -hmm. And gluten is highly inflammatory to not, you don't even have to have celiac disease, you can just have a gluten sensitivity. It creates massive permeability issues and upstream metabolites of inflammation and through molecular mimicry, cross reacts with multiple tissues. So, you know, just, just take a thorough history, clean up as much as you can, and um, diet number one. And then look at functional medicine testing to look at food sensitivity, gut microbiome ecology. There's fabulous tests now on gut microbiome ecology. Fabulous tests, either DNA probes or cultures. Look at uh, zonulin. Look at permeability. Look at histamine. Look at his DAO enzyme that breaks down histamine. Look at your inflammatory cytokines upstream. Just do lots of work. Work with an experienced practitioner who knows the terrain of this integrative field. And um, to do as much as you can afford to do. <laughs> and if all else fails, access that self-referred individual who is not identified with the objects of perception, which is this physical body. I mean, I'm not being glib, I'm being real. You know, it's... Consciousness is everything in the end. Great tips, doctor. So if our viewers want to contact you for more information, how can they get to you? Um, how do they get hold of me? My clinic is uh, the Hoffman Center, uh, www.hoffmancenter, R-E, spelled the British way, dot mm -hmm. com. The phone number there is 403-206-233. And we have Instagram and Pinterest, I, I don't know the how to, I don't know all those names, but uh, maybe we can give you a slide with everything on it at the end. You know, excellent. I, I leave that to other people. Uh, yeah, Doctor, we are grateful for your research, your wisdom, and for generously sharing all the information with us today. Thank you so much for being with us, Doctor. Nice to meet you, Ravi. Thanks for asking me to share what what I've learned over the years. This concludes our interview, but our work is just getting started. 
If you feel excited by what you just heard, then please share it with other people in your life. If you want permanent access to all the 21 plus amazing interviews, presentations and transcripts, then check this out. You can download the entire Crohn's and Colitis Summit plus a lot of valuable resources as bonuses. This empowerment package is available for a huge 64% discount between now and the end of the summit. For more information, visit www.guthealprotocol.com forward slash empower. Thank you so much for joining us in the Crohn's and Colitis Summit.